Today, uh, on Exposed, the Kalo podcast, the New Hampshire primary, the first in the nation, is now over. And of course, Trump won. No surprise there. And the number one issue for voters is actually the border. But our troubles, well, it's not just on the southern border. So with all the money from huge donors, many uh, Democrat mega donors, especially with all the media pushing her as the alternative to Trump, with all the pundits telling we the viewers how great Nikki is and how only Nikki can beat Biden. Yet, fact of the matter is she's out and Trump is in. And this is what you and I have to deal with on a regular basis. We have to be able to discern exactly what the news cycle is really saying. When the first reports came out, it was kind of early in the morning. You might remember if you got a chance to watch it. It was uh, early in the morning, and uh, there was uh, six voters that voted in one of the notches up there in uh, uh, New Hampshire. And it was six to zero. Nikki wins all six of these votes. Now, this is relatively a very Democrat small community normally anyhow but you should have heard the news media boy they were they were oh my god she wins all six votes could this be a sign of what's to come I mean, it was just absolutely ridiculous but by the time the race was called that evening it was obvious that although Nikki did a pretty good job let's face it I mean she did come from behind uh she did you know work hard she went you know through almost every single county there. She shook hands, met with people, uh, yet she still lost the race. And my thoughts were, okay, is she going to bow out gracefully or is she going to kind of push this to the next level? And I, I was wondering, because here's the thing, will she end up taking this two or three or four more states or who knows how many, um, or is she going to get beat like a dirty rug? Because I, I think if she puts herself out there too much, Trump's going to wail at her. And she's going to lose in big, big digits. And I don't think that's going to really do well for her political career in general. So I think against all odds, as I'm watching the news unfold, I'm saying to myself, well, there's no way she's going to stay in this race. I mean, she knows she's losing already in her home state. She knows Nevada's definitely a loss. There's no way she's going to stay. But I was wrong. <laughs> there she was. She gets up and she does this almost like a victor speech. Like, well, we won. Well, we did it. Uh, although she didn't use those words. Um, she was on top of her game. She jumped ahead made the announcement very early early in the evening. I mean, right after uh, the news called the race for Trump, she comes out. And now with DeSantis, you know, gone from the race and him throwing his support behind Trump, I just couldn't believe my eyes nor my ears that she was actually taking a victory lap. Because I would think at this point in time, if she really cared about America... She would get behind the lead candidate and let's make this thing happen. Let's get into the race itself. Let's destroy Biden while we still have a chance. But that didn't happen. So what is happening right now around the world? I, I think we're at a point where if we don't consolidate soon behind one candidate, um, the backup plan for the left has got to rely solely on the legal issues against Trump. And, and believe me, they're going to be working diligently to try to get something to stick because I don't know what else they could possibly do. Of course, you know, we don't want to think about the worst case scenarios. But the surprising thing about this whole race is that it seems that Trump has been kind of a different candidate. He seems to be more subdued, more gracious, and I believe more presidential. Now, of course, in his remarks when he got out there, he was, you know, fairly upset that Nikki would take the bow as if she won the race. 
But um, <laughs> the news media, especially on the left, they, they just have been driving me crazy because here's, here's what they were saying. Well, there's never going to be another election. This is our last election. And I'm like, what? What are you saying? Th- this is our last election. They were literally saying that if Trump gets into office, there's not going to be another election, that he's going to somehow be a dictator. I mean, come on. He wasn't a dictator the last time he was in office. It, 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 it's almost to the point where any reasonable, rational person who watches the news has to walk away saying, ah, these people are crazy. I mean, they're really throwing the kitchen sink at Trump, trying to make him look like the worst candidate ever. I mean, a dictator, never going to have another election. Another interesting thing that was unfolding, and that was that Biden, as you you, you might know, he decided not to bother with New Hampshire. There was a, a little controversy about um, he him not wanting New Hampshire to be first, and so anyhow, he had to be a write-in candidate if you were going to vote for Biden. And what happened last night, and, and this to me kind of tells volumes, if you will, about the left. He won 40% of the vote. He never showed up there. He didn't do anything at all in the way of running for election. And these idiots actually voted for him. They wrote his name in, and he got 40% of the vote and won the primary for the Democrats in New Hampshire. So to me, it's extremely clear that, no, they're not independent thinkers. I mean, the left, they seem to be blindly following behind the maestro, you know, the puppet master, uh, Barack Hussein Obama. I I still think he's the one pulling all the strings. I I mean, to keep Biden pretty much locked up in the basement, I mean, he has one conference, one news conference. He has one, they call it a rally. They got like 200 people there. And of course, they they zoom the cameras in to make it look like he's got a large audience. They don't dare zoom out to show you. The lead in New Hampshire started to close between Nikki Haley and Trump. As the the race progressed throughout the day, we didn't know what was happening. But once the results started trickling in, the first results showed that Trump was only like six or seven points ahead of Haley. But by 8.09 p.m., they called the election for Trump. And at that time, he was up, well, between like 10 points and eight points. It was kind of fluctuating because it was only like 10 or 15 percent of the vote that, you know, had been counted to that point. So the lead really was kind of immaterial. The fact of the matter was Trump was going to win. And they called the race. He won the race. But yet every news channel, other than like Fox News or Newsmax, every other news channel was like holding out all this hope for Nikki Haley. Something else that was pretty significant and and a little hard to understand is that New Hampshire is one of the few states that allows voters to switch parties in order to vote in the other party's primary. And what they found through, you know, polling after people went in and voted, uh, they speak with people and, you know, kind of get the sense of where they were voting and what they did and whatever. They found that like 40% of those who voted for Dickey Haley were not just independent. No, they were Democrats that switched parties to vote for her. I, I, I mean, this kind of tells me something. I, I, don't, I don't know about you. I, I, I kind of think you're just about as smart. And we look at that and we say, if the Democrats are crossing over to vote for Nikki Haley, that should be a clear sign to us that, well, I don't know if she's really the greatest candidate in the world, for Republicans. So the call of continuing on as a second tier candidate, uh, you know, down to Nevada and then over to South Carolina, it, 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 the only way that makes sense is if you were going to win somewhere. I mean, if there's only two people in the race and you keep coming in second, <laughs> what, what does that mean? Well, it means you're a loser. Okay. It's great you're second, but there's nobody else in the race. But the two of you, 
So if you come in second, it means you came in last, okay? And I don't understand why you would keep going. Now, you got to have money to keep going. And we know that Nikki's got a lot of money. And that came from the wealthy Democrat donors. So there's there's something underlying all this. You, you know where I'm going, right? Um, the money is coming from never Trumpers. It's coming from the rhinos in the Republican Party who want Nikki Haley to be president because if she's president, at least they know, you know, they're not going to get indicted. Uh, you know, they're not going to do a full investigation on what happened at the 2020 election or what happened on January 6th uh, or all of the, you know, frivolous lawsuits that have been coming against Trump. There, there's not going to be any investigation into that if Nikki Haley were to be president. <laughs> I mean, these people have been playing this political game for 40 and 50 years, some of them. And they're the ones that are supporting Nikki Haley. So, I mean, that's a pretty clear sign to me. But other than that, why, I don't know, why would you stay in the race? I mean, if it's me, I'm not going to stay in the race. I'm not going to be humiliated by coming in second every single time. The only reason to a reasonable person is to create chaos. In other words, you're there to create a problem for Republicans coming together in unity. So the very thing that Nikki Haley tried to put on Trump, calling him the chaos candidate, basically everywhere he goes, chaos follows, that was her words. Um, that's exactly what she's bringing to the table. <laughs> so she is actually acting like, sounding like, talking like a Democrat because that's what they do. They blame Trump for the things that they're actually doing. They claim he's doing, but yet they're the ones actually doing it. So here she is claiming Trump is, bring chaos, is bringing chaos everywhere he goes, and yet she's the one bringing chaos. So my question is always why? Why? It's got to be only to hurt Trump and to help the big guy, Biden. Why else would she be in this race? She's the moxie to come out and act like a winner, okay, after losing. And taking this victory lap is literally a slap in the face to Trump. So you should be asking why, just like I am. And the answer is obvious. She wants to get him upset. She wants to get Trump to come out of this new character that he's in, this, this, this new ability to be gracious and sound like a good presidential candidate. She's trying to get him out of that mode. And for a moment, he did last night. For a moment, he kind of reverted back to the old Trump. For a moment. But then he switched gears again pretty quickly. I believe she got the go-ahead from some of her largest donors to continue on in second place, losing in order to create chaos in the Republican Party. That's what I think. That's what I believe. And I think we're seeing it come to pass right before our very eyes. So I can pretty much say this clearly. The fight for Trump to become president is going to be on all sides. What I mean by that is he's going to have legal problems. He's going to have business problems. And now he's even going to be fighting his own party. Don't tell me that that's not purposeful, because it is. That's a plan. And it sounds like a radical Democrat plan. And sure enough, Nikki Haley is playing the main part, the main role in that plan. Her, her chant that she is the only one of all the candidates, well, at the time, the all the candidates, of course, now it's down to her and Trump. She's the only one who could beat Biden. Uh, yeah, I don't know about that because I don't necessarily believe the Democratic polls that have been out there. All the establishment, all the judicial forces, all the money is all aimed directly at keeping Trump out of office. They want to keep him out of a second term. They're frightened about this guy getting into office. Of course, they're saying it's because they think he's going to become a dictator. But we know the truth. The truth is 
he's going to try to clean house during those four years. And then Nikki Haley said this. She says, every time I ran in South Carolina, I beat the establishment. And I, 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 I literally almost lost it right there. Yeah, of course. But now you're the candidate and you are the establishment. So you're both right now. And there's no way that you are going to win South Carolina because the South Carolinians know better because they know you. Now, unless she's vying for a second tier position, what I mean by that is like vice president, and I don't think Trump's going to give it to her. There's no way at this point he would uh, cowtail to that kind of pressure. Unless, unless it's for the sake of the party. Now, think about it for just a minute with me, if you will. If Nikki Haley is gathering support from people on the left and independents, wouldn't it be possibly a good move to pull her into your administration? Maybe not in the position of vice president. Let's face it, maybe not. But pull her in, offer her a position that she's going to like, and yet keep very close tabs on her. Keep your thumb, if you will, on, on her at all times. I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I'm not running. Trump is, and I trust him. But I do know this. It's getting more and more interesting every single day in this election. And, and, and the exciting part is we don't know what Trump is going to do next. <laughs> I, I love that about him. Now, another issue is that South Carolina is a winner-take-all state. And since she was the governor there and has, well, many contacts down there, I think it's possible that South Carolina may be the place where she's kind of putting all her eggs in that one basket. I, I don't think it's a good stance for her. I don't think it's a good position for her to take because she does have a lot of weakness there in South Carolina. In fact, the polls show Trump up like 30 points right now, even if it was off tremendously. And Trump is up half of that, 15 points. That's a huge lead in your own state. You know, to be humiliated in your own state. Well, like I said, that's something I don't know if she can recover from. So all this has me kind of grasping, what is Haley's plan? She can't really think she's going to win, okay? So why run and why spend millions and millions of dollars and never win first place? I mean, something's wrong, right? Could it be she wants maybe a little more name recognition? Could it be she wants to be shown as a fighting candidate? Which, in all honesty, she is. She's fighting. I don't know. I don't know, but the inter interesting thing about last night is the numbers behind the numbers. In other words, we hear about you know who won and who lost and what the margin of victory was. But the numbers behind the numbers show that there's still a large number of Republican voters who will not, under any circumstances, vote for Donald Trump. So if Trump is going to unify this party for the sake of the nation, I mean, he's going to be put in a very tough position, I think. And, and I want to win. I don't know about you. I want to win. As long as Trump is the number one candidate, as long as Trump is the president, it almost doesn't matter who the vice president is. It almost really doesn't matter. Of course, in the case of Biden, it does matter because if he were to get in office, we know that uh, Kamala um, is probably going to end up being president in the second term because this guy is losing his cognitive abilities on a daily basis. But, you know, when Trump got up there finally to speak, he went right to the heart of the matter. He, he was Trump all the way. He said, I can't believe that Nikki Haley got up, you know, and made kind of like a victory lap. He, he got right to the point. But Vivek put everything in perspective by calling out never Nikki for who she actually is. And of course, he did this on, you know, the campaign trail as well. But the crowd absolutely roared when Vivek kind of called out who Nikki Haley is and who's actually supporting her. 
And then Trump gets back in at the microphone and he slammed the Biden border. He calls up uh, Tom Holman, uh, who did a great job on the border for Trump while Trump was in office. And he, too, knocked it out of the park. Very short. You know, he didn't speak long, but he made it very clear. The border can be secured. We will secure the border. And Donald Trump is the only man who can do this job. Uh, Tim Scott gets up to the mic for a couple of minutes. He's all fired up as usual and calling on the party to come together. And uh, let's make uh, South Carolina the last stop. Uh, that's his state. So he he's really hoping that all the chips are going to be on the table in South Carolina, and it's going to be winner takes all. Trump says, uh, you know, Nevada... He said, yeah, we got to go to Nevada. Nevada's next. You know Nevada. I love the way he talks. And uh, he said, you know, we already won in Nevada. And, and, and you know, the way it, it made it sound like, what? Did I miss something somewhere? He goes, no, we already won in Nevada. And the polls got me up like 50 or 60%. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, he said, the only reason, you know, we got to go to Nevada is because it's a formality. <laughs> I'm going there just to, you know, pick it up. But I know we already won. So, this is going to be a very interesting few weeks on the calendar. Uh, I think it's a month out before we actually get to South Carolina. But the real issue of the day, and on every channel, no matter what you listen to, you heard the same uh, truth. Uh, for instance, you don't hear truth too much, too much on M MSNBC or CNN or any of those, but they actually did speak the truth, which was kind of interesting. 41% of all the voters were voting as the number one issue being the border. That's what they cared about. That's what they want fixed. And as a matter of record, okay, just so we're on the same page, you know, it's not just the southern border. <laughs> we have problems with our borders. And we've kind of neglected looking at the northern border, Canada. We, you know, Trudeau is probably one of the more liberal um, neocons in the entire world. He is all sold out for a one world order. And he and Biden are really cut from the same mold. Anyway, the U.S.-Canadian border is facing a massive surge in migrants. And they're crossing from Canada into the United States, and we're not hearing a word about it. I mean, not a single word has been in the news at least on TV, about the northern border. What's happened is there a lot of Mexi a lot of them are Mexicans at this point, but there's people from all over the world, but the majority is Mexican. And what they do is they get on a plane and they fly from wherever they are. A lot of them, like I say, from Mexico. They fly into Canada, fly into Montreal, and then they work their way down to cross into the United States border, um, kind of much like the migrants do at the southern border. And the organized crime, the criminals that are, you know, smuggling drugs and guns and people, you know, that are pretty much sold into slavery, uh, they're doing the same thing on the northern border in Canada as well. He says in 2023, Border Patrol agents apprehended roughly 7,000 people, a nearly 500% annual increase. A large number of people, he says, that are looking for a better life. The vast majority of people that we catch are still individuals looking for uh, that American dream, trying to get into the United States. However, he says the increase in illegal crossings makes it more difficult for law enforcement to find people who are actually crossing for nefarious reasons. There still are a lot of bad actors mixed in with them. Um, we still see aggravated felons. We still catch uh, a lot of bad people. In one sector alone on the northern border, the number of illegal migrants crossing over into the United States has gone up 700%. 700%. I mean, look, 700% when you start to think about those numbers, thousands of people, a lot of them from Mexico, coming into our nation. But we've also got people from Haiti, from Guatemala, uh, all working their way into Canada. Why is Canada letting them in? How are they getting let into Canada? What are they saying? They're going to visit friends? They're going to visit relatives? Uh, they're we're on a sightseeing tour? I mean, what is it? 
You see, Canada is working with Biden, Trudeau, hand in hand with Biden, in order to bring more illegals into the United States. They're coming through an area, uh, northern Vermont. Listen to this. In a small Quebec town of St. Amand. They're going into this little town. And believe me, the people in St. Amand know that they're migrants. Why? Because they see these people, different nationalities. They don't speak English, different colors. And, you know, they realize what's happening. So it's not unusual for the people in this small town and other small towns along the border to see migrants crossing the border into the United States every single day, just like it is. Down south, it's happening up north. So we have a real issue, friends, when it comes to illegal immigration. And only now is the truth becoming known. Right down to the election. It's coming down. We're only a few months away from a national election. And it seems like more and more truth is coming out. And the number one issue is the border issue. So will people vote to secure our border? I hope they will. Listen, if you haven't subscribed yet, please do so. We appreciate you. My name is Mike Kahlo for Exposed, the Kahlo podcast.